How's it going everyone? Welcome to Bolingbrook Church Online. Today you will be hearing an awesome word from our pastor David Oseguera and we can't wait for you to receive a blessing that we believe comes from heaven. Now wherever you are, we invite you to open your hearts and your minds and, and send yourself in this moment because we believe that God wants to transform your life today. We believe that you have come to this online experience for a reason and right on time. So we don't want to hold you up. We want you to enjoy this word. Take care and God bless. Hey, Bolingbrook Church family. I am so excited to be here with you today. And as I said last week, when we started going through the passage in Genesis chapter 3, I said this one story, this passage is so rich. There's so much to unpack. There are so many implications from this one story in Scripture that one sermon can't do it justice. So this is part two of what will probably be a three-part mini-sermon series in the midst of this bigger sermon series that we're in called From Breath to Life. So wherever you are, I want to invite you to pause with me. Let's have a word of prayer so we can ask God to prepare our hearts for what we're about to read. Let's pray. Gracious God, I want to thank you so much that you've given us this book, this Bible filled with stories of your character and of your love and how you will stop at nothing to reconcile us back to you. My prayer now is as we explore Genesis chapter 3, And as we look at its implications, not just for when it happened back then, but for how it still affects us today. God, may this be more than just listening and learning, but that your your spirit would use this word as a seed for transformation in our lives. I pray all this in your name. Amen. So today we're continuing our sermon in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, and this is a spoiler, or not really, because we've already started this story. But in Genesis chapter 3, here's what's happening. The story tells us that in the Garden of Eden, there was a man and a woman named Adam and Eve. And God had told Adam and Eve, listen, you see all of this garden, you see all of these fruits, all of these trees. Out of any of it, you can eat all of it as much as you want. And I kind of hope that in some sense, God says, you can eat as much as you want and you'll never gain another pound because these calories are free. At least that's my picture of what eternity will be like. But God says, look, you can eat out of any tree that's in the garden, except for one. In the middle of the garden, there was a tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, of that one tree, that one tree, only one, you cannot eat of, but you can have everything else. And so the story tells us that Eve, as she was walking in the midst of the garden, she gets close to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and out of nowhere, a serpent comes up and entices her to eat of the tree that God said, do not eat. And here's what the serpent says. He says, didn't God say that you shouldn't eat out of any of the trees of the garden? Right? He's already changing the words of God. Because what God said is, Eve and Adam, you can eat freely, right? The word freely is a word of abundance, of permission, of freedom. He says, listen, you can eat freely out of any tree. But the devil comes, because we know that the serpent is the devil, and the devil comes and whispers these doubts into Eve's ear. As we said last week, the devil's goal in this story was to distort the words of God. And by distorting them, he would disorient Adam and Eve. He would confuse them. And by doing that, he could then sow a seed of doubt into their lives. You see, the devil wasn't trying to claim Adam and Eve away from God. He was just trying to get them to veer off the path and off the way that God had created for them. You know, it's interesting because when Eve responds to the serpent, when he says, God said you can't eat out of any of them, she said, no, no, God said we could eat of the trees. But then when she gets to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, she says, but God said we can't eat it, we can't even touch it, or else we'll die. Except that God didn't say that. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He didn't say you couldn't get near it. Already, she's already confusing the words of God in her own life. And what we find is that whenever the words of God get distorted, 
Whenever God's message for us gets distorted or confused or muddled in our own mind, it's really easy for us to begin to drift off of the path that God has created for us. And that's what we see in this story in Genesis chapter 3, that when God's word is distorted, it's really easy to be derailed from the path that God has for our lives. The psalmist in Psalm 119 verse 105 says, God, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word is a lamp. It provides light. It guides us in this world. And the closer we cling, not only to the words that we find in Scripture, but I encourage you to go back to last week's message where we talked about who the living word is, which is Jesus. That the more we can cling on to Jesus the easier we're going to be able to stay on the track that God has created for us. Because it's important for us to cling to things that are eternal. I think we live in a world where it's really easy for us to fall for temporary fixes, for quick fixes. We go for low-hanging fruit because we think it's going to satisfy us. And yet what the Bible teaches us from Genesis chapter 3, that even though we may go for the low-hanging fruit, Even though we may try to take a shortcut to the blessing that God has already promised us, but sometimes when God promises a blessing, it takes longer than we want, so we as humans start looking for shortcuts. You know, that's what sin is when we try to get God's blessing in a way that is different than the way God desires for us. And the moment that we start taking shortcuts to getting the things that we think will bring us joy many times, Through that shortcut, we will find heartache instead of finding the abundance that Jesus desires for us. And so the psalmist writes, God, your word, your son is a lamp to my feet. It is a light to my path. Friends, if if we can cling to Jesus more tightly, it doesn't matter if you can't see what's in front of you. It doesn't matter if you can't see beyond the horizon, but if you can cling to the edge of the cloak of Jesus, he will guide you down the paths that he created for you. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, the Bible says, All of Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness so that the person of God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. I love how it says all of Scripture is inspired. And the Greek word for inspired means God breathed. Now now think about that for a second. The book that you pick up, the Bible, or whether you open it on your app or on your tablet or on your phone, but the words that you read are inspired. They are God-breathed into existence. You know, we know that God inspired these humans to write this word. And they use their context and the world around them and their experiences to understand God. But what they all have in common is that All of the Word of God was God-breathed, inspired. Remember just a few weeks ago, we talked about how when God creates Adam, He forms him out of the dirt of the ground. And he looks like a human. He has everything that a human has, but he wasn't a living being. He was just a lump of dirt. He only became living when God breathed His breath. Into him. And the Bible says that when God breathes the breath of life into Adam, Adam became a living being. And now the Bible writers use that same language to talk about Scripture to say that all the words of Scripture are inspired, they are God breathed. Now, I don't know about you, I love to read books. And most mornings, when I can find time, I try to read a little bit. It's really hard, it's a very busy life for all of us. But I love reading. And there's some books that I reread year after year because they're so meaningful to me. But now imagine 
what God says about the Bible, that it is breathed by God. I've reread some of these books over and over, but what I find is that as good as some of the, my favorite books are, they pale in comparison to what happens when I read God's Word. I don't know about you, but we spend all sorts of time researching the best ways to live the best life. We buy courses online to teach us how to live a better life. We, we buy sessions with a life coach. We go to a therapist. All of these are good things, by the way. I'm not making a judgment about them. But I wonder what would change if your life if, on top of all of these good things you are doing, if you spent more time in the Word that has been breathed by God. I wonder how your life would change. Because when you come to the Word of God, it's not just about making you feel better. That sometimes that happens. It's not just about becoming a better spiritual person or having a stronger faith, but the Word of God actually opens our eyes to the ways and the views and the perception of God. And it also recalibrates our mind and our world view. And it recalibrates our heart and our soul. Now, I want to show you from a story in Scripture how this is true. So we've been talking about the importance of making sure we get God's Word right. And about not allowing anyone or anything to distort God's Word. That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. The serpent, the devil, distorts God's Word to Eve. He deceives her. He confuses her. He creates doubt that, hey, God didn't really say that. And even what God did say, I don't think he really meant. I mean, go back to Genesis chapter 3 and read that. And what we find is that when the serpent, when the devil is able to confuse us enough, then we don't know where is up and where is down. But there's a story in the New Testament that talks about the importance of clinging to the Word of God. I'm going to invite you to go to your Bibles in Luke chapter 4. I'm sure we're going to have it up on the screen, but I always love reading an, an actual physical copy of Scripture. I'm not sure. I know, I know there's nothing more sacred about a book than a device with God's Word on it. Everything is sanctified, right, if it's God's Word. But I encourage you, grab a Bible, buy a Bible. You can get a Bible for really inexpensive or very expensive. If you like expensive Bibles, just DM me and I will send you links. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Bible lover. <laughs> But I want you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And we're just going to go through this story and we're going to unpack it. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. You know, it's interesting. I want to pause here for a second. I don't want to make too much out of this because I feel like this story that we're about to go in requires four, at least four different sermons, maybe even five. But I just want to touch the surface of what's happening here and the importance of God's Word. You know, it's interesting that the Bible tells us that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we're full of the Holy Spirit, the idea that most of us have is, well, if we're overflowing with the Holy Spirit, that means we're having this spiritual high. Being filled with the Holy Spirit means that we are living a life of faith. It means that we're on the path that God has designed for us. It means that we are connected to the presence of God because when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's, that's our life's goal. Our goal is to be filled by God's Spirit. And when that happens, I think our mind seems to think, well, if we're filled with the Spirit of God, then what could possibly go wrong? Am I right? When we're filled with the Spirit of God, what could possibly go wrong? And yet here in Luke chapter 4, it tells us that Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Now remember, about a month ago, we started talking about how when God creates... 
that, that, that what was there before creation was like a wilderness or chaos or uncertainty. And here we see, again, the Spirit of God that hovered at the beginning of creation. The Spirit of God is now filling Jesus. The Spirit leads God into the wilderness. Again, that tohu vavohu from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. That nothingness, that chaos, that disorder, that darkness. So in many ways, this story is mimicking Genesis chapter 1. And so now the Spirit of God is filling Jesus and He leads Him into the wilderness or that, that place of chaos and desertedness, that uninhabitable land. And what we find is that just because someone is filled with the Spirit doesn't mean that everything is going to be perfect in life, but that when you're filled with the Spirit, God has designed and designated a plan and a purpose for your life. To be filled with the Spirit of God means that God is going to set you on a trajectory to fulfill the plan and the purpose He has for your life. And what we find here is that Jesus has a plan. There is a plan and a purpose for His life. And the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God leads Jesus into the wilderness where for 40 days He was tempted by the devil. Now who sends Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit of God. And so what we find here is that God is about to do something powerful. The wilderness was associated with uncertainty, with darkness, with chaos. And it is precisely in that chaos that God sends Jesus. Now the Bible says in verse 2, For forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during those days, and when they were over, he was famished. Forty days without food, being tempted by the devil. I don't know about you, and, and I don't know how Jesus was able to do that, but if I go 40 minutes without food, I start to get hungry. I start to worry if my blood sugars are going to drop, right? Like we live in a world of plenty where food is really easy to come by. But here we see that Jesus is depleted of the physical nourishment that he needs. And here's what the story is going to teach us, is that during the time that he is tempted by the devil, he has no food, he has no sustenance, Jesus is able to endure and overcome even the greatest temptations of the devil because he was filled with the Spirit of God. Because he was filled with God's Spirit, and it is that which gave him strength. So I'm just going to go through this briefly. Verse 3. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become a loaf of bread. Jesus answered him, It is written, One does not live by bread alone. Now it's interesting, the devil tries to tempt Jesus' own security and identity he says, if you are the Son of God. But see, what the devil has failed to understand is that before Jesus was led into the wilderness, Jesus was baptized. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes out of the water of baptism, when he comes out of the water, that there was a voice like a dove that came out of heaven that says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God had given Jesus identity by calling him his very own son. So when the devil tries to tempt Jesus on that basis, Jesus says, I am my father's son and I am loved by him. The devil says, command this stone to become a loaf of bread and it will become bread. I will make that stone bread. But Jesus says, it is written, one does not live by bread alone. So there's two things that I want to point out here. Number one, and what we're going to see here for every one of these three temptations that the devil tempts Jesus with, Jesus responds with a version of, it is written, or it is said, always referring to Scripture. Remember, we started this sermon saying how when the devil tries to distort God's word in our life, he helps us, it makes us veer off of the path that God has created for us. 
You see, Jesus understood that for him, the thing on which his life was founded, the foundation was the words of God. That's why when he responds to the temptation of the devil, he doesn't say, devil, you don't know what you're talking about. He doesn't say, devil, I am stronger than you. He doesn't say, devil, I'm going to tell my father. And you know, what Jesus says and shows us how to do is he refers to scripture. He says, it is written. God's word is never changing. It is written that one does not live by bread alone. And Jesus says, look, it's been 40 days where I haven't eaten anything. Bread is not what is keeping me alive. It is the power of God, the Holy Spirit that is keeping me alive. So why do we go to the Word? Why do we spend time in prayer? Because it is by those means by which we are open to the Spirit of God to be poured in our lives. You want to live with power? Spend time in the prayer room. You want to live with power? Spend time in the God-breathed Word of God. Don't be like Adam and Eve that were so easily deceived in the garden, but rather fortify your heart, your mind, and your soul by spending time in prayer and by spending time in the Word. You see, what what the devil was actually trying to tempt Jesus with in this moment was for provision. The devil knew that Jesus was hungry. The devil knew that Jesus was depleted, and and I don't care how committed you are to your fitness, if you go 40 days without food, you're going to feel less strong. And so the devil not only questions Jesus' identity, but he also tempts him with provision. You know, we're entering a time in our collective history, I don't know about you, but I see news headlines every single day, and at least one of those headlines is about how bad the recession that's going to come is going to be, and how bad the markets are, and how bad the economy is, and all of this doom and gloom. And in the back of my mind, I I try not to worry about that. I try not to worry about that because the scripture tells us that God will provide whatever we need, but there's a little bit of that fear. What, What will this mean for us? And so we think about how are we going to provide? How am I going to provide for my family? How am I going to provide and make sure that we have a home and that we have a house and that we have food and that we have a car and that we have gas? And what we as humans do, we begin to plan and we begin to think, okay, how am I going to provide? But what Jesus shows us in this is that provision doesn't come from ourselves or from anything the world gives us, but that true provision will come from the Lord. You see, the first temptation is to make us doubt that God can provide for us. The first temptation that the ancient serpent, that the devil is trying to tempt us with is that God will not be able to provide. But I'm here to tell you that one way or another, that if we cling to the edges of the cloak of Jesus, God will provide and so that's the first temptation the second temptation i'm going to go into quickly in verse 5 it says that the devil then led him up and showed him in an instant all of the kingdoms of the world and the devil said to him to you i will give their glory and all this authority for it has been given over to me and i give it to anyone i please if you then will worship me it will all be yours Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. The devil comes to Jesus and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world. He shows them all of the kingdoms of the world and the power that comes with him. And he says, Listen, if you will just bow down to me, I will give all of this to you. And, Jesus, you don't have to go through that painful death that you're going to go through. You don't have to hang on a cross, humiliated, battered, and bruised. I can give all of that to you. All, Jesus, you have to do is bow your knee to me. Remember, sin is trying to take a shortcut to the blessing that God desires for you in a way and going to get it in a way that is outside the way God desires. And so the devil was trying to tempt Jesus and saying, I can give you a faster way to the blessing 
But you see, what the devil failed to understand is that when Jesus is made king of the world, it's not that he cares about ruling over people, but about inviting more people into his eternal kingdom. You know, and it's interesting because Jesus says, listen, listen, devil. He responds again with, it is written. God's word is eternal and never changing. And he says, I will only worship the Lord my God and serve only him. You see, this temptation that the devil was trying to tempt Jesus with was of power, of earthly power and gain. We live in a world where we're trying to always get one more thing, one more shiny object, one more dollar, one more point of interest on our returns. We're always looking for more and more and more. And Jesus says, be careful what you give your time and your energy and your emotions to. I remember Jesus saying that where you store your treasure, there your heart will be. For Jesus, the earthly material things meant nothing because Jesus had been in heaven and he had seen the glory of what true riches looks like. So anything that this world could offer him paled into comparison of what eternity will be like. And so Jesus could not be persuaded to bow down to the devil because Jesus knows that what was at stake was the eternal salvation of each one of us. The devil tries to tempt Jesus with earthly power and gain. But Jesus refused to go for the quick shortcut. He refused to go for the quick fix or that low-hanging fruit. No, Jesus was determined to stay on the course that God had provided for him. And the way that Jesus does that is by clinging to God's word and his promise. Jesus would inevitably endure the pain of the cross. He could have had it all in this moment, but Jesus preferred to follow the way that God had carved for him. And family, this is the decision that you have to make. Pain and suffering isn't always bad. Like, The absence of pain and suffering isn't happiness because sometimes it is through the difficult circumstances in your life that your character is shaped and forged in that crucible experience. Sometimes we need the difficult moments in our lives because our character needs to be ready for the blessing that God has prepared for us. But if our character isn't ready for the blessing, we won't be able to receive it. If our character isn't ready, we won't be faithful to do the thing that God has asked us to do. I can't tell you how many stories we read about in the news or people we know whose character wasn't ready and then they have this opportunity and they have a moral failing because their character wasn't ready. The second temptation is really about where do we tr- where do we put our trust? Do we put our trust in earthly gain or do we put our trust in the Lord? You know, it's interesting because the devil says like Jesus, if you bow down to me, then I will make you ruler over all of this. Jesus of course doesn't. But then after his resurrection in Matthew, after the resurrection before Jesus ascends to heaven, The Bible tells us that all authority on heaven and earth has been given to Jesus. The very thing that Satan was trying to give Jesus, which was not his to give, Jesus still attains it, but he does it because it was part of God's will for his life. So remember, when things get hard in your life, when you find yourself in front of that obstacle, that immovable object that is in front of you. Perhaps that is exactly the path that God has created for you to form and forge your character for the blessing that God has in store for you. And then we go to temptation number three. Verse nine. Then the devil took him to Jerusalem and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. 
For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to protect you. And on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him until an opportune time. This third temptation, the devil says, Listen, you say that your father loves you and that he will always take care of you. So then show me, show me that what you're saying about God is true. Throw yourself down from here and let him send his angels to protect you and to save you. You see, this temptation is about trying to sow a seed of doubt in Jesus that his heavenly father cannot actually protect him. This is a temptation about where we seek our protection. From where does our protection come from? The devil, through these temptations, is trying to get Jesus to doubt that his Father will do what he said he would do. The devil is trying to get Jesus to doubt the words of God. But what we find in this story and what Jesus teaches us and what we must do in our own lives is we got to make sure that we hold on to the words of God. And so it starts in Scripture, but it must always lead us to the person of Jesus. Jesus is the Word. He is the living Word. And if we can hold on to Jesus, then we can have faith knowing that God will provide for our families and for us. And He will provide our needs. If we can hold on to Jesus, he will help us to not worry about the things of this world, but rather to focus our eyes on the eternal world that God is creating for us so that we can spend an eternity with God. That the things of this world, they will grow dim one day. But when we come into the light of Christ, we will finally have our eyes fully opened to see the very presence of God. Can we trust God to provide? Can we trust God to give us the blessings in this world that we need? And can we trust God to protect us? For Jesus, the word of God was enough to hold on to his heavenly father. It's my prayer for you today as we've gone through this word, that the way that we avoid repeating the fall of mankind during Adam and Eve's time in the Garden of Eden where the serpent distorted God's word and created doubt in their minds, that the way that we stop that ancient serpent, the devil, from distorting God's word in our life is that you got to spend time in the word. You've got to spend time in the word. And you've got to spend time in prayer. Because through prayer we are filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit can lead you into the wilderness, can lead you into the uncertainty, but you can know that you can face even the greatest of uncertainty if you are filled with the power and the presence of God's Spirit. I hope this message has been challenging, but I hope that it has filled you with a sense of knowing that God is able to do abundantly more than we could ever have imagined. Let me pray for us. Gracious God, thank you so much for teaching us how to live. God, thank you so much for giving us these stories in Scripture and reminding us that you have created a path that is set before us. My prayer is that you would give us the faith and ability to stay on the path that you have set before us and that we could cling close to Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you all so much for coming out to Bolingbrook Church Online. Listen, we are so happy that you were able to be here online. But if you want to join and be a part of our in-person service, come over to 301 East Bountain Road in Bolingbrook, Illinois. Saturdays from 10.30 a.m. and another service at 12.30 p.m. We want to let you know that today is a special day and today is called Connection Sabbath. And our online, our, our in-person location will be gathering together in groups 
where we'll be sharing the word together, sharing a meal, sharing some laughs, and just connecting with your fellow Bonebrook Church member. We can't wait to see you there at 12.30 p.m. Listen, wherever you are, you can get to know exactly what's going on here at Bonebrook Church. And all you have to do is sign up for BC Weekly. Go ahead and there'll be a QR code here on the screen right now. Take your phone out, turn your camera on, point it at the screen, and it'll send you to a link that you can click on to sign you up for Bolingbrook Church Weekly. It's a bulletin where you'll understand exactly what's happening week to week and month to month here at Bolingbrook Church. We want you guys to stay connected with us. So fill out our online connection card as well. Go to bolingbrook.church forward slash connect where you can connect with us and we can see how we can help you on your walk with Christ. Wherever you are, we hope that you are blessed and we hope that this sermon that you heard today, that this word that you heard today was a blessing and that you come back and you continue being a part of our online community here. Thank you so much for being a part of this church and the movement that God is doing here in the Bolingbrook Church area. Thank you guys so much. Take care and God bless.